Honestly, I'm torn. I get why they did this. It makes Melody feel like a more active participant in the story. It doesn't feel like everything she did is sort of set and, and, and done. However, I do think there was a nice distance created by that buffer of having to view what happened to Melody through the evidence she left behind. And when you remove that buffer, which we'd already done some of, but you fully remove it here, and it starts to feel almost like cheating. We shouldn't know all this stuff because Dan doesn't know it. There's no way for Dan to know certain things that we were seeing. And it felt like we shouldn't be privy to them. I agree. Because it's like that that's the part of the keeping part of the mystery alive for, yeah. for Dan. It's kind of violating the premise a little bit. Right. It's episode five too. Like if we do if we do this at episode eight to wrap it up and to really understand her her arc or something like that, that would be different. But it's too early and too much. Welcome, friends, to episode 224 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we usually read the book and then see the movie. I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And I'm writer Luke Elliott. And this week, we discuss the second half of season one of both the podcast and the TV series, Archive 81. Okay, so we finished the second half of both show and, and podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm excited to jump into this because I feel like we were we were pretty passionate about a, a, the, the show being canceled, and now we have the full context of yeah. seeing the entire show and having finished the podcast. So, you know, lots to talk about here. Yeah. Are we uh, are we full spoilers for the rest of the series? I mean, I think overall, like, if you're coming into this now, let's just say spoilers. We're going to get into more specifics as we get to other yeah. episodes, but general spoilers are coming. Yeah. I want to ask you, man, if I needed to go to the, down into the fucking chasms and open up a portal to travel into another dimension, would you come with me? Uh <laughs> What was it he asked Mark, like, uh, if it was all for the podcast? Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> dude, let's let's go. I mean, if there's an adventure to be had, I think I think for the sake of the podcast and our friendship. You're going to a demon dimension with me? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, for the sake of the podcast and our friendship, we got to go in. <laughs> yeah, man, I, th- that, that moment was funny. You don't see something like that very often, I feel like. This bro friendship, but also like a tender moment. Like, you just don't see that very often in TV. So it's pretty cool to see. I was also just happy to see it for their characters. Like, yeah. for Dan. Man, I was I was so excited that Mark didn't fucking... I, mean, I, I was so worried he was going to go full, like, LMG or whatever. And and he and, and said he, he pulled it through. Which I should have realized because Dan and Mark are both the names of the creators of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it would be pretty fucked up to, like, take one of their, you know, basically stand-in characters and have them have him betray the other one or something well and and it's pretty crazy too because this story uh you know going through the podcast i was thinking like oh they're definitely gonna do some changes here and and they kind of stuck as true as they as they could to the source material if you had listened to the podcast going into the show you definitely have like some good context for what is probably going on and what how, how this might turn out yeah, I mean, uh, the, that that we got to start with the podcast, right? Because that was the way I experienced it first. Listen to episodes six through ten of season one, and uh, before I watch any of of the you know follow up episodes of the show, and uh, we won't we won't summarize them here, but we'll just kind of jump around and talk about some standout moments. So, uh, any anything come to mind initially for you is like just cool standout moments. This is a little bit more general, but the podcast did a really good job of effectively using the medium and knowing there is a purpose to telling the story in an audio format and finding ways to make that as interesting as possible and to build up tension because you're not seeing what's actually happening and to uh, like kind of play with certain character dynamics and relationships and, you know, not being able to see someone like in this case, Dan, who's we're hearing the tapes from, you can't see the person to see that they're like slowly losing it, right? Like this character is obviously at times losing it. So you're left to imagine like, what, what are they, how do they look right now? Are they hunched over and creepy looking or are they, you know, very just like blank? Um, so I found myself like really visualizing a lot of what was being delivered in the audio format and then just distortion and, did, and all did the Did you find things. yourself filling in like the actors from the show a little bit when you were listening? I think I probably was. Yeah, I did. I totally did. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like they, like I mentioned last week, the 
the effects were still a standout for me, the way that they played with a lot of that stuff. And and overall, just this is a smaller scale project because they, they kind of knocked it out in, in a very short period of time. And I was impressed with like how intricate the story was. Like there was a lot to it, right? Now they, I'm sure they were writing it for a while before the recording, but just the recording was a quick period. But in, in horror, there's always this push and pull between explanation and mystery. And this series really made me think about that because so much of the horror and the style of horror that the show is um and, and the podcast too is about what you don't know and it kind of is like the 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 fear that your own mind creates it's trying to find answers to fill in the blanks as the podcast went on we started to get more answers but there's an inherent mystery to listening to audio because you can't picture, like you said, like, what does this person look like right now? Um, you hear something creepy, but it feels like this disconnected sense, right? Like, usually we're, we're getting to experience things with multiple senses, and here we're only getting the one. Um, and so because of that, you're, you're left to fill in the blanks. And your mind can conjure up some pretty spooky shit. So depending on where you're at in your headspace at the time you're listening, you might be coming up with something that's incredibly terrifying and, and maybe even kind of nebulous and hard for you to really put your finger on, but it just fills you with dread. Um, and that that's a, a strength of this kind of storytelling. Um, it won't work for everyone, but I think it does lend itself to this style. Um, and then these episodes are 15 minutes long. They, they pretty much stuck to that format throughout. I think one might have like 16 or 17, but no, nothing too long. And because of that as well, like so much of the story kind of takes place outside of the episodes. And that's where the filmmaker got a lot of place to play, but also had to make a lot of decisions and a lot of like, well, I guess this is what it is. And uh, there was a little more mystery left in the podcast for me, even if we got some quasi answers, I was still a little bit unclear on exactly how certain things worked. I don't know. I, I, where were you at with that? Did that work for you? Or did you find yourself like going, oh, I can't wait to watch the show and actually find out what's going on because I, I assume I'll get more answers? You know, I, I actually really appreciated the sort of lack of information we got because it's 15 minutes. The found footage idea behind it. Um, we're, we're getting these little snapshots of like someone slowly being affected by this. And I, I also love the idea of just having a week between these episodes to like stew and talk online about like what people, you know, all the theory crafting that was probably going on around this podcast. And I found myself in the show, honestly, thinking back about how well it worked for me in the second half. I was like, man, like th there's something about not overstaying your welcome and, and like, just like telling a brief story because, the, and again, this is something I'll talk about more when we get to the show, but you're taking eight or I'm sorry, you're taking 10, 15 minute episodes and turning it into a tv show like you're gonna have to fill in a lot or you're gonna feel people are gonna feel like nothing's happening happening at times and i think that you know it can be a side effect of adaptation but i also feel like if that's the case maybe have less episodes you know like do six episodes do you know what i mean do like try to condense things and did you feel like they should have done that here or did you like the I, number i kind of felt like they should have done less episodes as far as the show is concerned for the podcast there's a reason why it's left at such a cliffhanger. We're getting these small snapshots, some crazy shit went down, and then it's very clear at the end of it that they're getting a season two, which I know the show also wanted. There was supposed to be a season two, and that's sort of where they're leaving it. Yeah. Um, but just in terms of like my satisfaction, my time invested, like the podcast really gave me like a great, fun, unique experience that, like I said, it, it has a purpose for being in the medium that it is. And I think the show tried to flip, like change things to make it, a purpose for that story existing in in film and in TV in this case. So yeah, it'll be interesting to explore that when we get to the show. I do think there's something to be said for the expectation that, that the listener brings to a podcast like this because they're 15 minutes and there's so few of them. I think you're able to deliver what it delivers. And if you can feel satisfied, if these were 10 hour long, hour and a half long episodes, and you still felt like they weren't giving you any answers, you might start to feel like, well, we have, we're spending all this time and we're not exploring. You know what I mean? So it's almost like the time constraints fit the level of detail that we're getting, um, which is that, you know, that's, I mean, that as a compliment. I think it was well-crafted in that way. Um, 
So I, I actually want to talk about a couple of standouts for me that didn't make it into the show. Um, and, and some of them I was kind of surprised because I was, I was thinking we were going to get. So I think it was in um, episode six. We first meet a character named Victor in the podcast. Well, we don't even meet him. We hear about him. And his whole thing is he cannot be recorded. And he can't have his photo taken. And he can't appear in like a camera or anything like that. He's just he's just absent. Like he looks like a streak of light or something and like cross photos. And when, and then uh, Melody ends up trying to test how close she can get to him. And then there get, becomes this distortion on the recording. And I thought that was a really cool idea, right? Like it's it doesn't really fit within the the umbrella of this sort of demon god that we're we're talking about here as we go on. So maybe that's why it got cut. But they introduce this Victor character who comes back later in the season and ends up having a fairly important role using his sort of weird power he has. Um, and it's never explained, right? Because we don't ever know why he's like this. Um, so maybe that was another thing where they were like, well, I don't think we can get away with not explaining it. But it, it was pretty cool. And I was curious to see if he'd show up and like how that would be represented in the show. We talked last week about the show, right? We were talking about how if it didn't have enough answers, then you you can understand that the reason why it got canceled was because people weren't going to be satisfied because it didn't have a finite ending. And I honestly feel like the opposite was true. I yeah. think so much was told. We were over explained with what was going on. And when, where we talked in the first half about how much we loved that, like it was a mystery in terms of like what is being affected here. And then the podcast kind of sticks to that, like, what is this weird thing? What is that weird thing? This world is a crazy weird world. It's not just one specific incident of some fantasy sci-fi, you know, horror elements going on. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that is a general, it, it didn't like, like I still like this television show. I, I'm a fan. I wish there was a season two. I would have been really interested to see what they could have done with season two. I'm sure we'll talk about that more, but I agree. I, I have some criticisms of where these episodes went and some things that I thought, yeah, as far as like explanations go, I think we maybe got a bit much, but but going back to the podcast with uh with this character who can't be seen or heard, taking advantage of the medium is like I was saying, like it's such a smart, such a cool idea. Um and then we're also getting another character in a little bit who um can't see faces and stuff. Yeah, that was the next one I was going to talk about. This guy can't he sees like a weird like flat flesh face. And I, and this one I was sure we were going to get in the show. Because I was like, oh, that would be a creepy effect. You could pu- you could definitely pull that off. Um, and I like that at the end, she sort of, it's implied that he can't see her face. Oh, I love that and part. And that was, that so was creepy, right? Like, she's like, what does my face look like? And he's like, what do you say? Like, you know, exactly like you think it does or something like that, you know? Something kind of like misleading. Yeah, nothing at all, that, you know? But the, I love that idea that like, he had to see a certain number of people per day so that like the people that he loved and people close to him hopefully wouldn't be the ones that he could no longer see their faces. Oh man, that was creepy too. When he was talking about how he used to date somebody and then all of a sudden he couldn't see her face anymore. And then he was like, I had, we, he's like, yeah, we had to break up because I couldn't like, I guess once he can't see your face anymore, it's permanent and he can no longer see it. Right. And she could tell that like something was off and yeah, it was wild, really interesting, cool story stuff that you don't have to explain. You can just have it be weird mystery stuff within the world. Yeah. It's kind of that we talked about how the, the creators of the podcast said they were inspired by um, the X-Files and some other those like monster of the week kind of shows. And that's what I thought of there. It's like different supernatural elements coming in and intersecting, even if there is a larger story going on, not all of it is directly related. Um, and I kind of like that. It's kind of like the idea of that. It, I, I like the idea of the, the, the viscer being this like nexus of paranormal activity for some reason. And maybe there's something at the heart of it, but it attracts different kinds of paranormal activity, um, and different kinds of people. That's where I was at with it. Um, Real quick about Victor, something that occurs to me is you'd have to make a decision if you were going to put a character like this in the show of can an omniscient television viewer see the character and the character just doesn't show up on in-universe recordings or can we not even see him? And if that's the case, that becomes pretty difficult to show you would have to make that decision. And I, what I, I, I kind of like and dislike it in two ways, right? Like 
I, li- I like that it could kind of include us in this whole like media consumption thing. Like we're a part of viewing of this and, and we have the same limitations that they have within the world. That's pretty cool. I like that sort of meta involvement because that's very like the podcast. Like you said, it's super meta. You have to engage with it in that way. And you have to be of the right tone, right? Is this show fit the tone of, is it like Black Mirror where it's like, oh, like, you know, you're a part of it. Everything, you know, this is like all a commentary. But the, but the entire show isn't found footage. Right. So yeah. that kind of creates a problem. Maybe that's why they went away from it. As far as the tone of the show and what they were doing, like I think you go with he can be seen in the, the film camera of the show, but not in. Yeah, the... I think you would have to go that way. Well, as well. And I don't like that as much. So I think that's why he got cut. That's my guess. Maybe maybe I'm wrong. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, how cool it would have been really cool just to have this like streak of light. It, weird... That's the one thing is like it would be pretty cool to see like how you could pull that off. Have a character who just can't be recorded. You also can't hear him, too. Right. So it's like, he, is he just garbled? No, you do hear him at one point, though, in the, in the podcast. You hear his voice. And I think it's because he's I guess maybe he's further than 30 feet away and he's yelling. And he says something like, oh, am I being recorded or something? Like, I think you, you get a moment where you realize it's him. And then and then that's it. Um not sure what exactly was going on there. Again, because there's a lot of just like noises and shit that happens in these final episodes where you're trying to fill in the blanks of like, what is actually happening right now that I'm hearing? Brings up an idea where it's like, if he can be recorded from afar, can he also be filmed from afar? That was my question too. Yeah, I'm like, what are the, what are the rules here? You could do a lot of testing. It was fun that they did some testing, but yeah. Um, so let's bring it back to the, to the uh, one thing that does carry over into the show. And that's the character of Chris, who's this like addict. Who's, abs- who's addicted to this drug, which has no name, I think, in the actual podcast, but they call, I think, Stardust or something like that in the, in the, um, or Starlight, Star something uh, in the show. But uh, here he says that it's in the paint of the building. They consume it, and then he is clearly addicted, um, and then he dies vomiting, I believe. Maybe caused by Samuel, because Samuel shows up right around that same time, right? It's it, Again, it's kind of unclear what exactly is happening sometimes, right? But that kind of works in this format. Especially because so much of it is off recording. And then Samuel kidnaps her, and we we get he gets, starts having this like crazy voice where he seems like he's possessed by a demon himself or something. Um, we get Ratty, who... Uh, like, his squeakies are definitely pretty like not realistic stock audio yeah like, it's, it, it sounds like a dog squeak toy to be quite honest i yeah. think they were just squeaking a squeak toy um something like that but um and it, it, it was kind of like disney-ish the way he would talk to ratty and ratty would respond like me, 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 right. me. like like almost like it's like a animal crossing language or something <laughs> Right. He tried to lampshade it and say like, oh, you're my conscious and I have to, uh, you know, I'm trying to talk to talk this through with you and stuff. But yeah, yeah, it was definitely very like Disney. And then uh, Samuel eats Ratty. So I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I wonder if that's going to make it into the show because we have Ratty in the show. And I was like, dang, you know, are we going to are we going to see Samuel eat the rat? But Ratty just kind of just disappears at a certain point in the show. I was kind of disappointed to see that. Ratty was around when he was around in the show, and then sometimes he was gone for a long period of time. Yeah, oh, it's like, oh, yeah, the rat's still there, and then and then he was just gone, period. I thought for sure that somebody was going to kill his rat, and he was going to get all upset about it. Yeah. I also thought it was effective. There was this character named Iris, who we meet, who's from, like, another company. There's apparently, like, two companies that are that are competing, and Iris, something's wrong with her face. And, he, and uh, we, we, we get... Um, Davenport. Is it Davenport in both? Okay. He is saying to her... You know, I'm sorry about what happened to your face. And we don't really know what it is, um, but she's apparently disfigured in some way. And then we hear in this episode her being tortured by Samuel and she's screaming and it sounds very intense. And we get the impression that, like, this is what caused her face scarring. Um, Again, we never see it. So it can be as horrific (laughs) in your mind as you want it to be. I kind of felt like at the end, Samuel became the demon, too, right? Yes. And I thought we were going to get more of that in the show because... Then you can have the sort of all the performance of an actor, but imbued with some sort of, you know, otherworldly power. Um, It's been done many times, but I think it can be effective. Um, We did not really get that. In fact, I was pretty surprised with how little Samuel shows up in the final episode, especially of the show, which we can get to. But here here in the podcast itself, this final episode, there's a lot of sound. There's a lot of mysterious stuff going on. Melody averts the ritual in some way. Um, and then Dan 
gets teleported at the end of the it's it's very like weird and unclear there's like another ritual that's going to take place he's talking with samuel um and then he he thwarts it as well but not really and then like i think they're like samuel slash the demon god is sort of released was my understanding of it yeah something like that i mean it's intentionally vague right we're we don't know what happens to dan there's going to be a season two. And admittedly, I only listened to it once. I, I could have probably listened right. to it a few times and tried to see exactly what they're going for. True. But again, there's just kind of a lot of sound sometimes. And you're like, what, what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things where they could go many different ways in season two. And they could say that like, oh, man, to explain what happened, you know, yeah. the, the demon didn't actually get out. He almost got out and then go from there or he is out and they're dealing with that. So, right. Uh, I, I would I do want to say when we're, we're wrapping up with the podcast here, I do want to continue on. You know, I want to see what else happens. And, I, almost, and it's I, that, I actually clicked on the trailer for season two and I started listening to it. And then I was like, wait, wait, wait I can't listen to this because it, right. it's too much talking about what's going on with Dan. And I'm like, I don't want to know in case that somehow affects my viewing of the show or gets into stuff that we're, we're not getting into yet. So I, I stopped. But. I it's super interested. short form and I'm excited, you know, 15 minutes episodes if it maintains that yeah. I, I, it's it's not a, enough of an investment to where like you can't just do it in an afternoon. And I think that there's something nice about having yeah. those kinds of stories. So absolutely. Well, and I fully recognize the irony considering our length of our episodes. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so one thing I do again, I just thought it was really cool how they would constantly use the meta story to tie in their their call to actions. And they, uh, the one that I really liked was apparently we've ha- been people have been attacking our servers. Uh, please join our Patreon so that we can afford to keep them running or something like that. Like I love that. Like people are coming after us. Help us defend against it. Join our Patreon. It's a good call to action. Like that'll get some people who are like really into it invested. Yeah, it was cool. Let's talk about the show. So I'm going to just go through and read the plot synopsis of the fifth episode here. And it's called Through the Looking Glass. Beatrice warns Melody, don't let it out. Dr. Turner tells Melody that he tried to sign her up for a study researching people with sensitivities, whom he called Baldung, but she was rejected. Melody discovers that Father Russo died after going to a mysterious meeting the night before. She discovers that Father Russo had been investigating the Visser and that Samuel had multiple fake identities. In Father Russo's research, she finds descriptions of a cult called the Baldung Coven and an image of a statue like the one she saw in the community room. The statue depicts a being called Kalego, who is both god and demon. Melody realizes her mother's ring has a Baldung sigil on it. At the art show, she sees that Annabelle's work is covered in mold and the paintings are all of the same woman. She confronts Samuel when Chris, a junkie, falls from the building dead. Watching Melody's footage, Dan sees Virgil share a look with Samuel on the street immediately following Chris's death. Virgil tells Dan that Samuel was his brother and that he thinks Melody murdered Samuel and may have set the fire that killed Dan's family. Yeah, I like that she's a, she's a sensitive type, right? She has this, she has the shining. The shine. Uh, okay. <laughs> she has the shine. Um, also, she is maybe a Baldung. Um, mm-hmm. Also, Baldung is a kind of a terrible name. It's a bad name, yeah. Yeah, the old Baldung. Um, <laughs> I was trying to look it up to see if it was like a real thing. I don't think so. I think, no. they, I think they just went with Baldung. So I actually, now that you're talking about that, let's let's. I, I do want to talk about something that I found in my research. I wouldn't have known outside of this. So apparently, many of the goings on of the story, many of the characters and things like that, uh, all tied together to be sort of referencing Dante's Divine Comedy. Oh, okay. The references to Dante's Divine Comedy are many. The main character's name is Dante. There are characters named Virgil and Beatrice, Dante's guides, as well as the Circle, a reference to the Circles of Hell, and Charon slash Charon, the ferryman in hell. Sure. Taking something that's as epic and as widely known as something like Dante's Divine Comedy and then having like another like world, obviously, with this like upside down other, I forget what they even call it in this, but uh, having something like that and then the ferryman. Uh, and obviously they're they're doing something with like an alien god interdimensional being demon thing i i thought i just thought it was cool that they were taking this sort of like sci-fi story and then incorporating like almost like fantasy elements yeah it is cool um and i I just wanted to say there is a painter apparently named hans baldung and maybe it was some sort of reference to this painter i don't know their work super well maybe it somehow tied into the dante's inferno stuff or i don't know um that was probably it's probably something with that um, but <laughs> getting back to the episode, I, I did think it was interesting that this was our first episode that was like fully from Melody's point of view. 
I don't think we got any Dan. We, sh we He popped up a couple times to, like, say her name at her and kind of startle her, but, like, we didn't get his perspective throughout the entire episode. Um, and we we lose a little bit of that, like, found footage element, although she, there is some stuff where she she is watching certain things on TV and stuff like that. I do think the show's at its best when it is playing with that direct media element of, like, one character watching something else and then you can just... It becomes distorted and weird... I think it's not as good when we're seeing things through the like TV lens, the omniscient lens, um, because you lose that. Um, there's like a because there's a layer and there's like a, 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 a there's something between you, a barrier between you and the original thing. Your mind is trying to create the connections like what caused this distortion and you can come up with anything a lot of the time, right? Whereas when you have that omniscient TV camera, it's like telling you this is what is real and what 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 actually happened. And anytime that's the case, it's like not quite as scary and creepy to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and that's the premise of the podcast, right? Like right. it's it's leaving a lot of these things up to interpretation, up to you trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, I agree with you that that's the stuff that I like in the show. I, I do think it's smart of them to switch gears and not have Dan just be in the bunker for another episode. I think that, that that's a good idea. But also, this is where I started to feel. And it's so funny because the first four episodes, I didn't feel any of this. And then we jump into the second half here and I start feeling like they're spinning their wheels. Like they're they're trying to dig into a story so deep that I don't want the answers to. And uh, like I wanted some answers. I wanted some stuff to happen. And it felt like they really started to, you know, she's looking into the father that they introduced who like had all these, the multiple identities and like they're starting to, as it's, it, things that were obvious to me, think, you know what I mean? Like I hate when it's, it's like some of the things are so predictable and you're, you're building up to a conclusion where you've already put the pieces together and they're just trying to like, it almost feels like bide their time until they, they give you the showdown, the, f the finale. Um, and I definitely felt that a little bit in this episode, but more so in some of the other episodes, but Concentrating on Melody, I liked her basically becoming the main character and getting that like 1990s look at everything. And then the next episode also gives us like another perspective shift, which feels like they're again trying to interact with the story in different ways to to really flesh it out. Honestly, I'm torn. I get why they did this. It makes Melody feel like a more active participant in the story. It doesn't feel like everything she did is sort of set and 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 done. However. I do think there was a nice distance created by that buffer of having to view what happened to Melody through the evidence she left behind. And when you remove that buffer, which we'd already done some of, but you fully remove it here, and it starts to feel almost like cheating. We shouldn't know all this stuff because Dan doesn't know it. There's no way for Dan to know certain things that we were seeing, and it felt like we shouldn't be privy to them. I agree because it's like that. That's the part of the keeping part of the mystery alive for yeah. for Dan. It's, it's kind of violating the premise a little bit, right? It's episode five too. Like if we do if we do this at episode eight to wrap it up and to really understand her her arc or something like that, that would be different. But it's too early and too much. Now I will say the uh, the stuff with Annabelle I think works pretty well. She she is she's doing this art. She's drawn this mysterious woman's face, which we only see at the actual art showing. Um, this Cassandra character is clearly working against Melody and has befriended Annabelle and has befriended uh, Jesse and is clearly part of this cult. Um, I did think it was interesting that we got some reveals about the demon, this demon god, uh, Kalego here, who um, I didn't think we were going to get that as early as we did. And I kept thinking like, oh, well, I already know this from the from the podcast, so I'm kind of spoiled. But then we got it. The first episode I came back and watched, I was like, well, well there's the reveal, basically. Mm -hmm. So now it's just going to be about how they deal with it, which I actually thought was kind of cool. Um, and for the most part, it worked. It just, and we'll talk about different moments that maybe didn't work as well. We did get Chris, the addict character, show up. Um, I did like that he he said some exact things from the podcast. Um, I, I, I appreciated some references that were like that. Um, and then he, he falls to his death instead of this like vomiting death he has in the podcast. And I got the uh, I got the implication that this was somehow caused by by the cult or Samuel. But we never get confirmation of that. 
maybe it would have come in season two, or maybe we're just supposed to be like, just assume it, and we don't actually need the confirmation. I don't know. Was that Did that feel like a dangling thread to you? Like, what happened to Chris? A little bit, but uh, with Virgil showing up right as it happened and being standing next to Samuel, it felt like it was planned by the organization in some way. Maybe John Smith, the security guard, killed him or something. Maybe we didn't need to see a scene of it, but... So episode six is called The Circle. Mark tells Dan he found Thomas Bellows. Thomas was hired by Virgil to digitize VHS tapes. He experienced delusions in the research facility and died after leaving. Dan breaks all the cameras in the facility. Melody learns that Annabelle had a psychotic break and injured two people at the art show. She discovers that Miss Wall is poisoning people with mold and goes to inspect the source but is caught by Samuel. Dan discovers that Thomas was seeing the same face in the tapes that he was. Samuel takes Melody to the ritual room. The song she had been hearing is actually a prayer and her feeling ill when she hears it means she is the right one. Samuel shows Melody the snuff film, which is a ritual that was performed in the building the viscer was built on top of. Melody realizes that Jess is the sacrifice to hold the new world. Dr. Turner shows up to have Melody committed to a psych ward. A demon tries crawling through the screen to get Dan, so he smashes all the screens and tapes. He discovers a room similar to the one in the snuff film and is knocked unconscious. So actually, I thought this was a pretty good episode. Um, I like this one a lot. We start off with this William Crest doing his intro to the circle, and I thought they were they were evoking the Twilight Zone. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah, that was absolutely a reference to the Twilight Zone. And, um, you know, it's cool. I like the idea b- behind that. And and like you said before, some some of the times that I feel like the show is at its best is one, it's making some really fun and cool references. I, I, I'm really into that when they're digging into the tech, when they're when he's like cleaning things and, and like, you know, dealing with the analog nature of older technology. And in a little bit, we get this thing where he just like had this l- little bit of knowledge that there was a camera that came out that could record onto audio cassette tapes Very cool. and really low quality. Like that's such a cool thing to add to a show, like a cool, like little piece of research they did to, to figure that out. Yeah, I, I love all that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, making these references definitely, it wasn't lost on me how cool that is, but and, and I agree, this episode actually wasn't the one I was talking about before I mentioned that this episode, it was actually the following episode where they do like a change in perspective and, and have like a different, some yeah. different characters yeah. involved. This might be the strongest of the last four we watched. This is probably my favorite of them. I, I think I would agree with that. Yeah. One, one of the best parts also about this episode is that we get the Thomas Bella stuff and we're getting to see the footage that he had left behind that Dan finds. Yeah, and it's recorded that- as this like video thing where he's like talking directly to the camera um, which feels very modern in a sense like it feels like how you might watch like a tiktok or something these days but it was it was older obviously and we get to see him and how you get to see how much it seems like he's lost his mind right like right and you can feel well, and it's Dan's, not that old too he it was on an sd card so it's you know 10 years at the most but you so. can feel dan's nervousness at least to me, it felt like he was partially nervous because he's like, oh, it's the same thing I'm experiencing. But I think he was also partially nervous of like, this guy sounds really off his rocker here and maybe yeah. I am too. And that's what's cool about it is that we're getting to see Dan react to the advanced stages of dealing with LMG and all the yeah. stuff that's coming. And then that creates tension for us going forward. Like, is he going to, you know, and then we hear that he's dies in a car accident or whatever, like when he finally leaves and you're like, damn, Dan is kind of doomed at this point is, is what I was thinking. Now, we do also get another nice touch, which is we see Melody at the start of the episode being filmed by an unknown person and she's laying in a bed. And I I, I thought that was super creepy. I kind of wanted them to do a little more with it. Um, I don't know what I guess they would have done, but like it feels like there was more to explore with that because the idea of like, all of a sudden, the person who controls the camera is not the person who we expect. And Melody, instead of being behind the camera, is in front of it. Like, I, and it's not someone who we know has been handed it. You know what I mean? Like, I thought that was actually a powerful inversion. And it made me very off kilter and worried for her. Um, and I thought that was, you know, effective. I, it's implied that it's Samuel later on. We find out that she was, like, in his apartment. And, I, okay, th- this is another thing. There's a couple of tropes that pop up in this show that screenwriters need to be stopped. (laughs) This is an epidemic in TV at this point. It's gotten better in books. You don't see it as much because I think it's getting called out. But man, do TV show writers love to have characters get knocked out in one scene and wake up in another scene and be fine. And it's just a way of transitioning scenes. 
that happens, I think, at least once in every episode in this remaining, the remainder of this season, if not twice in some of them. Yeah, it's a really weird device to use that often, yeah. You use it all the time. It's not realistic. Head injuries are incredibly dangerous. The only the only one that I would give them slack on is the one that we're talking about right now, which is she passes out from seeing someone get killed. Yeah, yeah. I guess. You can do it once, probably. Right. But like we see Dan get a hit over the head at the end of an episode re- uh, uh, early on, it implied that it is Davenport, I guess, or maybe the groundskeeper. I'm not sure. Um, and then he wakes up in his own apartment. Um, then we see um, Davenport gets hit over the head later on. Um, and then I guess we don't see him again. I think uh, he just gets hit over the head and that's it. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think Melody gets knocked out another time. Somebody gets hit by, like, John Smith, I think, punched by John Smith. I think it's her. She gets knocked out. And then the next episode, she's immediately, like, talking to Samuel and telling him why his plan is not going to work and shit. And I'm like, you just got knocked uh, the fuck unconscious. Like, think about in real life. If someone punched somebody you knew and that person was unconscious for like 30 minutes and then you finally got them to wake up, they wouldn't just be like, fine. You know what I mean? Like nothing happened. Let's go. I'm ready to like have this, you know, finished out my adventure as if I've just had a a momentary pause. No, you need to go to the fucking hospital if you were unresponsive for fucking 30 minutes and have your brain scanned. Could be (laughs) a brain bleed or something Probably is. Um, So... The other thing is that if you've ever seen boxers or anything like that, people can take more than one hit to the head from the back of a gun or something. It's very easy to do, first off, in TV. It's always just like a bonk and they're out. It's like this shorthand that we've only accepted because we've all seen it in TV so many times that we're just like okay with it. And like, I feel like it's not okay. Um, And the other one that they do here a couple times and just bothers me so much is the cutting of the palm. Don't cut your palm. It's like the most painful area to fucking cut. You use your hand for everything. Like, I don't know. Just don't do it. I I guess sometimes I think they cut someone else's palm, which is a little more like, I guess they don't give a fuck how much they're going to hurt the other person. But like, it's just a bad idea to cut your own palm. And I do think we see at least one character do that later when I was like, oh, no, don't do that. Yeah. Not a big deal. While we're talking about stuff like this, um, I, I could not help but think about how there may have been intervention on this story in terms of certain aspects. Uh, from executives or whoever at Netflix because there's so many coincidences in this that feel like the story is adult 90s nostalgia stranger things um you get you get your upside down you have something that is very reminiscent of like the 90s and things like that you have an entire time period where you're like dealing with 90s stuff and it doesn't quite ever click into like being like this is about 90s nostalgia but there is a lot of things that people who appreciate 90s nostalgia or any kind of nostalgia yeah i I don't know if something about there there's so many small things that made it feel like they were like let's do something similar enough to stranger things but not enough to really have anybody say like it's the same thing um, and it might be unfair a little bit, but kind of similar to me. Maybe. I mean, there might be something to that. I, you know, and I thought there was a, a moment that evoked a nice sense of 90s nostalgia for me. She's calling Annabelle and she gets her she gets her answering machine and she leaves an answering machine message where she's like, are you there? Pick up, pick up. Are you there? I wonder if like Gen Z listens, like watches this show, if they're going to know what this is. Because this is such a, like a, an interesting period of time where like answering machines were a thing, and yet people screened calls. So you mm-hmm. didn't you if you were there, you would let it go to your answering machine, and then you would decide if you wanted to pick it up based off of somebody talking through the machine. And like right. that 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 was a very particular time period in the like nineties, early two thousands. And the fact that you could pick it up, it would be like if nowadays someone called you on your on your phone, and as they're leaving a voicemail, it was playing out loud for you, so you could pick up and jump back in and be like, "Hey, I'm actually here." Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. That's not a thing anymore, right? It's not. But it is funny. Like I I, I mean, like growing up and stuff, I had a lot of eighties and seventies nostalgia where I would like I would go seek out that sort of stuff, and I think it like think of it like ref- like really reverentially. Or I would think of it like it was something that I didn't get to experience and the grass is always greener kind of thing. So I think Gen Z probably looks back at things like this and they're like, oh, that's a cool thing that was around. And, you know, and she's like, I'll, I'll just page you, <laughs> which I thought right. was funny too. <laughs> um, okay. So there's a thing we got to talk about here though. Um, the mold. How did you feel about the mold? 
Yeah, I mean, not, I don't know, no strong opinions, I feel like. I was, it was fine. It was clearly supernatural. The swirls were cool to look at, but beyond that, it felt like when uh, you want me to make another Stranger Things reference, they're like, there's characters like coughing it up and things like that. And it feels very much like them coughing up whatever that like black ooze stuff was from the upside down. So. I can see that. It, it worked for me. I really liked it. Um, partially because I think I find mold to be very creepy. Um, it, super gross. The swirls reminded me of Uzumaki, which I haven't even read, but I'm just so aware yeah. of it. When I started thinking Junji Ito, and she's in this room surrounded by these swirls, and they're so mysterious. Like, why are they like, growing like that? Um, that creeped me out. I remember just getting like shivers about it. People kept touching it, and like it was like a weird shimmer to it, but it also seemed like raised i don't know is it, it for whatever reason that like had texture and crystalline and and it's also mold it grossed me out to be quite honest it was kind of yeah. tough to look at sometimes and there was so much of it i think that now that you say that the the uzumaki thing must be a reference like like to have it be in swirls like that i bet you it was probably like some sort of reference they wanted to make and if so i thought it worked um and then the, the moment that i really loved too was when all of a sudden the tape was covered in this mold and then he yeah. busts open the VCR and the mold's all in the VCR. And then the, I think in the same episode, we get the reveal that the mold is actually in the floor down below as he's like tearing up the ground and he sees this. And then he probably gets knocked out in that, in, when this happens too, I think so. We When we covered um, Haunting of Hill House, there was like the whole like supernatural mold thing where it was like they couldn't, they're like they would attack it, they would t- try to tear things out and it would just like supernaturally come back. And uh, there is something extremely terrifying about that, right? Like, you just can't get rid of it. And breathing it in is so bad for you. That's the thing. Like, they're talking about how it's toxic and it's, like, hallucinogenic and all this stuff. And yet everyone is just, like, breathing it. (laughs) She's touching it. I'm like, Melody keeps touching it. Yeah, Yeah, I was like, what are you doing? (laughs) Um, I thought it was effective. I like that. And it was a reference to Junji Ito. Well done. Um, I will say also, I think in in general, this show, it almost felt like it was PG-13 if you were to give it a movie rating except for they drop a lot of f-bombs um maybe too many honestly at a certain point which is something i I usually wouldn't say this is when i don't care about it right i I don't mind if they're i actually love cussing like i me too i fucking love cursing yeah so this is this is something that doesn't bother me in films but when somebody wants to have that fuck have a lot of emphasis in a scene that's when it starts to bother me because it feels like they're swearing for the sake of swearing and it's not like a natural thing you can't there is a point to where it can be overdone. You have to vary it up. And it felt like, I think Dan in particular was just saying fuck a lot in the same way over and over again and like frustration or something. And like, I don't know. It seems like I'm nitpicking a little bit. Maybe I am, but I did pick up on that too, though. Like I wanted, I, it felt like they went back to the fuck well too many right. fucking times. <laughs> it just felt like there were times that somebody would hold up a gun and be like, you're fucked and stuff like that. Like to where it's like the fuck, like the, the curse was why you wrote the line and stuff. Like it was just like, I, I don't know. Yeah. But I, I, it's a, that's a small thing too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but overall, again, I really like this episode. Um, I think it's cool. I, I, the, the, the snuff film stuff continues to be pretty creepy. I did want to ask you, and I noticed this for a few different things. It seemed to me like, for some reason, I could tell that what I was actually watching was like modern footage being run through a filter rather than actually something being filmed on old footage, like on an old film. Is there a reason you can't do that or is it like a shortcut they took? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's way easier to to shoot something modern and put effects on it and make it look like something that you shot because like to go and buy the first of all film is expensive to go buy the film and and like actually being on a production with film. It can't be exposed to light, uh, which is, you know, a a major thing like you have to be very, very careful. Um, You burn through as soon as you start rolling, you burn through like a few feet of it before you even start uh, before the scene before the director can call action. So like dealing with film like can be really tough. Hmm. Um, so just the idea of a TV show that has like a limited budget and like a you know a, a certain timetable they have to get it out in, you have to then take that film, get it processed, colorize it, and then digitize it, and then and then you're able to like. But is there something put with frame rate? Because it felt like the frame rate was too high 
for the old footage? Like, I don't know if old film ran at a lower frame rate or like, or we what? Were, we've been doing 24 frames per second as the norm because basically the way that you can tell frame rates is motion blur. So yeah. if you if you move your hand in front of your face back and forth, you see the certain amount of motion blur. Yeah. We've, they've like figured it out math wise that like 24 frames per second on film is what looks realistic to like normal eye frame rates. If you go higher or lower, you get less motion blur or more motion blur than what we're used to seeing through our own eyes. So um, the fi- it wouldn't have been the frame rate. It probably would have just been like a flicker that they added or flicker. something weird that some sort of some sort of filter or effect that they were adding to it. No, but it was like lacking is what I'm saying. Like when I was watching that, it t- looked too smooth. Like the movement oh. of the people looked too smooth, which that's what we That's mean. probably just the fact that it's modern film. Okay. And, and they're just like, you know, trying to make it look jumpy and stuff like like projection would look. You know, when you go to a theater and you see like certain imperfections and it's kind of like jittery, yeah. just slightly, it's just because they're projecting it and they were, and they're, they weren't, they weren't able to mimic they that. They were trying to like artificially do it and they couldn't achieve that effect like perfectly probably. Yeah. It just, whatever reason I could tell, like this isn't actually old footage. This is modern footage that has been made to look this way. I feel like if you'd taken a vacuum and just show me the footage, I would have been able to tell that. Yeah. So uh, I actually love that part of the the, like we're getting up to some in a little bit where like uh, Dan gets to see this not film and and like whenever they're doing that kind of stuff, I'm still really agree. Whenever they're watching something, it's like always good. Always the best part. It's really fun. Um, So so real quick, there is a moment I want to ask you about here at the end of this episode. The demon starts coming out of the screens. Right. Um, This is definitely the most like the clearest look we've got at this demon. It's coming out at Dan. He's smashing the screens. Um, I felt kind of mixed, but I ended up liking it more than I thought I would. The design of the creature? Uh, not just the design, but the, I, I thought the design was good. It was, it was fine. You know, it's a, he's a demon, <laughs> you know, he, he looked pretty right. creepy. He, looked, he was reminiscent of the figurine, which is cool. Um, but specifically the idea of a demon appearing in a screen and starting to come out at Dan and him smashing the screen to like lock it in and prevent it from coming out. Um, I would have said, I don't think that's going to work, but I actually think it kind of, I think it kind of worked just the scene overall, him breaking the monitors and stuff with the demon, like yeah. CGI demon kind of coming out. I actually thought it actually kind of worked. I like the scene overall. It was like a, you know, a rash thing to do, but like it was definitely helpful in stopping it. But my question was in terms of the rules of this demon, did he have a cell phone in his pocket and could, could it have come through the cell phone? Hmm. Like, does the monitor have to be on? And in- I think the screens were on, right? I think all the screens were on. Yeah. Okay. Maybe he can only come in through a landline. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but the 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 thing that I did like about it was, I was still I I didn't think they were going this route, but there's still a a little bit of a maybe Dan's imagining things. Maybe Dan's losing his mind, and how he would it would look so real, like this thing's coming out, and then he'd hit the screen, and I love that it just completely disappeared and went to a broken screen. Um, which makes you think like, oh, maybe he's imagining this. Um, so I was still like leaving the door like slightly ajar for like a twist or, or some sort of implication or just wanting us to to uh, grant credence to the idea that maybe Dan is imagining things and losing his mind. Um, so this reminds me of something that I wanted to talk about at the start of the episode. Totally forgot. But I'm bringing it up now. Um, when I was reading the description of this podcast and show i saw a term that i wasn't super familiar with last week and so i didn't bring it up because i wanted to look into it more and it's called soft horror and do you know about this term do you know soft horror like what they mean by that no okay i don't think i do so i i've heard of soft fantasy and hard fantasy that tends to refer to magic systems uh how how like rules oriented they are versus Mm -hmm. loose sci-fi soft and hard sci-fi obviously like how science how true to science they are versus not soft and hard horror I hadn't really heard of and I and if you go into it with that framework you're actually a little bit wrong because that's not really what they're talking about what they're okay. talking about with soft and hard horror as far as I can understand well here let me read you this this definition I found this is on urban dictionary so take it for what it is but still I thought it was a pretty good definition soft horror a horror game movie or kind of medium that doesn't use jump scares to scare the player or watcher but rather explores various techniques to create a feeling of terror without inducing a metaphorical heart attack. So that would be considered soft, would be soft not the jump scare? Soft is not okay. doing jump scare. So it's it's that creeping, it's that, um, it's kind of subdued, it's implied. Right, it's, so an A24 horror film. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, for the most part. And, 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 you know, like, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Like, as soon as you have one jump scare, oh, no longer soft horror. I don't think that's that way. But, like, there's a difference between that and, like, other kinds of horror movies where it's, like, jump scare after jump scare. And there's a certain thrill to, like, that excitement, that physical fight or flight response you get. And that's part of the appeal of it. Whereas this isn't really going for that, right? This is much more that implied creepiness. And it made me realize that, like, okay, now that I know that that's a thing, I also know that it's a thing that I like. Like, I like soft horror. That tends to be my preference. Um, I find I find jump scare stuff to be a little easier, a little... Um, it's more of a physiological trick, like, you know, loud noise, flash of something, you can startle me. Um, that's less interesting to me than the creepiness, which I think is a harder thing to craft. Well, and, and like, you know... I'm not going to turn my nose up at like a slasher film sure. and, and just like completely hate it. There are good versions of 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 all of this stuff, right? And, and like there is a time for each story as well. Like you can you can enjoy them. Uh, but uh, yeah, o- overall, I definitely gravitate towards like more you know th- thriller psychological. And so the reason I bring that up is again, I think this show is at its best when it is in that space and it's exploring the soft horror genre through. Dan and his his watching these old tapes and the creepiness of, of mystery. And I was talking earlier about how this show has been like, I try and find lessons that I can take into my creative life and from the things we watch and the things we read and the things we experience here. And one of the lessons that this underlined for me is like how important it is to, to manage knowledge in your audience. As much as you know, like, because you probably know everything, you got to manage how much you're revealing. And it can sometimes be really hard from, I'm saying from experience of writing my book I'm writing right now, to like put yourself in the headspace of a reader and go, what do they actually know at this point in the story? And where, what kind of headspace does that put them in? What is still confusing to them? And make sure you're managing that and controlling that. And that's important. And I think in every genre, every speculative genre, especially important in horror because so much of the fear comes from that mystery and that like not understanding what's behind things. And I think soft horror is at its best when it really manages that knowledge gap. And I think the show is at its best when it does well with that. It is, it, 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 I think in the next two episodes, it starts to get a little bit too much on the other side of that. It starts to explain a little too much and some of the fear I think backs off. Well, and, and I could feel my engagement also. Like I started to feel like the they were losing the plot a little bit for me, like just in terms of like where we were going, what we were interested in exploring. But I also want to talk about very quickly while we're like sort of halfway here, um, the cancellation of this show, right? Like okay. I, I don't want to leave it to the end. Okay. Uh, I think we should talk about it here. So the show was released January 14th, 2022, and it was canceled by Netflix on March 24th, 2022. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people listening have heard about some of the stuff that's been going on with Netflix recently, yeah. right? So I think that this the cancellation of the show had a lot to do with multiple different things. I don't think they that Netflix had this show release and then saw the response to it necessarily and said that they were going to cut it. I think they were in a situation where they've realized they need to scale, they need to downscale. Um, I was just reading something that in the past like two weeks a report came out that Netflix has just been hemorrhaging users. I think they said they, for the first time in 10 years, they reported that they lost 200,000 subscribers. So they've always been on the uptick. Um, and so for them to be having that situation going on, everyone's heard about the fact that they're going to get rid of family accounts, where if you have it across multiple addresses, you're going to need to get your own account. I wonder how much that announcement might have played into some of this stuff, because I feel like I heard that announcement around the same time I started hearing about them losing subscribers. I also heard the announcement of Archive 81 being canceled. I don't not saying this show is definitely popular enough to do that, but I also have heard that that's a pattern for them. They've been canceling lots of stuff. I think people are getting frustrated with well, them. Well, so, and, and I looked into it a little bit, and, like, Netflix has a certain way that they go about doing things, and it's, like, we're mentioning, like, sort of throwing things at the wall to see what sticks, and then and then riding that wave. And I think they're realizing that that model, they're spending, I mean, we've, in another report that came out recently, they're spend, they spent $30 million an episode on Stranger Things Season 4. So, you know, eight episodes, what is it, six, eight episodes, that's an insane amount of money for one season of television. Um, they are, they're... Not, they're needing to scale back. They're needing to put it on the users in terms of what we're going to be paying because they are spending so much money trying to keep up with the competition. And now it's going to get it's going to get harder and harder for them because other companies have other 
assets and things that they sell, products. Massive franchises that... Yeah, outside yeah. of just their film departments and things like that. So you're having Apple, they're competing with Apple who sell every iPhone in the world. You know what I mean? Amazon like, who sells everything in the world. <laughs> everything. So they're competing with these massive... And it was just a matter Disney. of time. I yeah. remember, I, I actually, I'm sh- positive that I said this on the podcast at some point, And that's that they wouldn't be able to keep up pace with the other like hulu and netflix and the ones that are specific to now hulu is owned by disney yeah they joined with disney so there's a lot of other stuff going on there netflix is its own entity and all they do is stream stuff they used to do the dvds now they stream stuff and i think we're going to see what happened to blockbuster because of netflix happen to netflix because of other companies that have a lot more going on i I don't know if i'd go that far i think i think netflix sticks around but i don't think they're going to be the big dog anymore agreed i think they were getting used to being king king of the hill for streaming and i I just don't think they will be anymore they were for a really long time i think they're going to have to find their way into being sort of an hbo where they have premium television that people want to subscribe to their service for in order and i think that's how they survive they might need to make smarter choices with the content they do create and give it more of a chance. Um, Which kind of, you know, it sucks as creatives too because there was a period of time where it was like you could go as a creative to Netflix and get almost a blank check and, and make something. I mean, I'm that's an overstatement, I'm sure, but yes, yeah. Of course, but it's a it was a double-edged sword because you might get canceled, but you also got the opportunity to make something. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's like sort of when it was the Wild West. So I also read that Netflix... Um, is cutting loose a ton of animated projects, yeah, which is really that. unfortunate. I was really sad to hear that because, again, that was something that they had going for them. They were spending a lot of money into creating uh, their own animated shows and then also having things like Avatar The Last Airbender got popular during the pandemic again because it was on Netflix. Mm-hmm. And then they have things like Castlevania and like she and like all these other shows that were like pretty popular. Um, Arcane recently. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's it sucks to see... Uh, a platform that was doing a lot of great things with animated projects. Now they're going to get rid of that as well. So it's just, it's really sad to see that. And that's why archive 81 isn't necessarily just going to be this, this moment where a show that maybe didn't deserve it got canceled. I think it's going to be part of a larger trend potentially. Yeah. I think it already is. Um, And now one thing I did hear, and maybe I'll have you look this up to confirm it, but um, I was talking to Wendy Wagner, former guest, And about this show. And she said that it supposedly actually they were told a certain metric of view viewership that they would need to hit and they actually hit it. And then they still canceled them. I I mean, I believe it. And I think it has to do with the money. People came and said, sorry, cut some shows. Yeah. So that's a bummer if they were like told, hey, you got to hit this certain number if you're going to get a season two. And then they hit that number and they were all like popping champagne. Hey, we hit the number. And then all of a sudden, hey, you know, we said that number uh, we lied. You're actually canceled anyway. Right. So to that to that point, I actually have some stuff that the showrunner Rebecca Sonenshine said after the cancellation and leading up to it. Uh, But first, I want to talk about the the sort of overall reception of the show. It has an 85 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Deserved. I think it's still a good show. Like, if we, I feel like we're being kind of critical here in the second half, and I'm gonna have some continuing criticisms. But like, this show overall was really good. I, I mean, I liked it a lot more than some other shows we covered on this on this podcast. So, Metacritic has it scored at a 73 out of 100, and it's generally favorable. When the show debuted, it broke into Nielsen. Now, so Nielsen is like obviously the long term, and that was the thing that people would look at. Uh, but as far as Nielsen's streaming rankings, it debuted at number seven and it reached as high as number two in its second week. So, you know, it, it peaked pretty high in terms of like what people were watching. Had a pretty good surge. Yeah, during a certain period. And um, to get to what Son and Shine said with the cancellation, thank you so much to everyone who watched Archive 81. Thank you to the reviewers who were so kind and thoughtful. We're surprised and disappointed that we won't be doing another season, in parentheses. We had cool new stories, found footage, Calego lore planned. I hope you'll remember us well. Damn, that does seem like a she, bow, putting, putting a bow on it. Yeah, and she went on to say, I think there are more stories to tell. I think we end on a good cliffhanger that needs to be addressed, and we introduce a lot of characters that surround Dan and Melody that have very rich and interesting lives to explore further. So, yeah, we hope to keep going. I think that was actually prior to cancellation. Okay. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe she's leaving the door open for another another company to pick them up because we see that happen with shows sometimes. They, they jump streaming services, get a second life somewhere else. Um, I think the show deserves it, honestly. I, I haven't listened to season two of the podcast yet, but regardless, like I feel like there is more story. There's a blueprint out there created by the podcast of how to address season two. 
the showrunner has shown that she is able to put together something pretty incredible. So I would trust her to do another season of this. I think it's worth it. So if, if Amazon wants to swoop in, uh, or you know HBO, somebody like that, somebody wants to swoop in and save this thing, I'm all for it. Episode seven is The Ferryman. Dan wakes up in his apartment, confused and without his mobile phone. He c- he goes to confront Virgil at LMG, but is threatened with legal action to stop him from continuing his investigation. Mark fills Dan in about what he has found regarding the Voss Society and William Crest. Dan realizes that the woman Annabelle was painting is Iris Voss. The episode then transitions to 1924. A woman named Rose is being interviewed for the position of maid in the Voss household and witnesses the arrival of the Calego statue. Iris leads a group in prayer to Calego. Later, Rose finds Iris bloodied after a miscarriage. The mold appears in the mansion and Iris sees it as a sign from her god. A Baldung witch, who had attended an earlier party at the mansion under a false name, attempts to steal the ritual book, but Jonah Voss shoots her. The Voss family plans to perform the ritual, but Lucas Voss leaves because he cannot reconcile himself with human sacrifice or the potential consequences. Iris proceeds with the ritual, which Jonah films. This is the origin of the snuff film William Crest saw. When Iris slits Rose's throat, a mysterious light appears which disrupts the film, ending the recording. Mark and Dan find Annabelle, who says that Melody has been waiting for Dan in the other world. The opening to this one is about all about this comet. That was a really nice touch to tie this fictional cult to real-world cults that have famously committed mass suicide and all kinds of really dark shit surrounding the arrival of comets. Um, I was I was definitely surprised at the extent of the flashback we got. I see that they... I think there was a couple things going on. I think they wanted to make the snuff film matter in a way that it doesn't if you don't know anything about it. Like, it's creepy on its own, but, like, it's different when you know the person who dies, right? And you care about them. And I think they did a good job of, of, of showing us her, this Rose character, and making us feel for her. Um, we get introduced to this Iris character. It feels like they had a lot more they wanted to do with her. She becomes important, but then her storyline doesn't really go anywhere in the final episode. I thought we were going to see more of her. We were going to learn something about her. She's potentially trapped in the same space, but I don't think we see her at all. Um, and I was surprised, right? And, um, then her brother mysteriously leaves. That totally seems like it's leading to something. I thought there was going to be some sort of reveal about what happened to him. We don't get any of that. So I think they left a lot of stuff open for season two. And it's such an unfortunate thing when you when chances are we're not ever going to see it. Um, and it feels like some of that stuff was probably created for the show. It was my suspicion. I don't know how much of that's actually in the podcast. Maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's tough because it's like to plan for a season two is something, of course, that you want to do. But you have to make sure that it doesn't like really impact your season one. Dude, <laughs> I, you are you're touching on a big problem. Uh, so I am working on a novel right now and I won't go into a lot of detail or anything. But let me just say that this is this is a huge challenge for debuts because publishers love the idea of a standalone novel with serious potential. So you want to write that, but that sounds great. But like when it comes time to finish your book, you have to make decisions about what what is a uh, an open question, what is a dangling thread, and what do I need to wrap up? And if you wrap up too much stuff, you won't leave room for that series potential. But if you if you don't wrap up enough stuff, you're leaving yourself open to tons of criticism of oh, clearly they're fishing for a sequel. And if you don't ever get it, then now you've written a book that is not satisfying. Um, and it's a big problem and it's, it's tough to do. And it's something I'm I honestly wrestling with right now. So when you were just saying that, I'm like, dude, that's totally a problem. Um, yeah. and I think that they hit that same problem here again, trying to put yourself in like the eyes of the audience and like figure out where that balance stands, like what's satisfying and what's like, you know, a, a fish hook for later. Like that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Because like, sure. I'd love to, you know, you'd love to write a book with the knowledge that you're going to get a second and you're going to get a sequel, but you just can't know that. So then you don't want, like, they're not going to buy it if they don't want to guarantee a sequel. You know what I mean? But then if you write a standalone with no serious potential, then that actually makes you less appealing because everybody wants to have something that sells really well and then be able to go, yeah, it's part of a series. Let's, uh, let's continue to cash that check. Right. Yeah. So it's the weird business side of things sort of impacting the art unfortunately, but it's just a reality of both. Uh, honestly, it sounds like both uh, mediums. Yeah. So overall, I, I enjoyed the flashback. Um, I think it's, I, I always like an opportunity to see like some period piece yeah. in, in a story. Um, it is 
I, I have to admit that it's very removed from the story that we were getting. Like it was a lot to go into. And again, this was where I was like, man, this is, I like seeing this kind of stuff. The flashback was basically an entire episode, though. And like, yeah, it was most of the episode. And it gave a lot of reveals. Again, well, and like, here's the other problem I have with it. This is sort of violating the premise the show set up. How does anyone know? No one knows this. We just are. We are privy to this. Dan and Mark are not watching this. This is not all on the film. It's based on the snuff film. And then and then but they like, only see part of that. They don't see all this other stuff. Right. I agree. I, like there, if there had been a journal if there had been something where they were getting this information, you could have then play with that form uh, again. But here it just felt like we were getting information we shouldn't know. And uh, I just always felt divided. Like, I don't know, conflicted. Uh, it's how I felt about a lot of these kind of scenes. And again, like you said, it has to do with the device that they yeah, set up. Exactly. I think in another story, you don't question right. it because you're like, okay, well, we're just getting this information. We are omniscient, clearly. Whereas I didn't know we were omniscient here. I felt like we were tied to the mediums. We were in Dan's point of view and we only knew kind of what he knew. Yeah, totally. Yeah. One of the uh, detail that I loved in this in this episode was this real world phenomenon. This is the kind of stuff Stephen King does all the time we talk about and other horror writers do as well, where they take a real world thing and they make it creepy. Like they introduce it into their story and they, they kind of go, well, what if? And for me and here it was this idea of spirit photography. Which, I have you learned about the spirit photography stuff? You know yeah, about it? Yeah, orbs and shit, yeah. Well, also just like there was a period in time where there was a, um, it was a business where these these hucksters, honestly, would, would set up a, 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 a business where they'd say, hey, come in. And I, ha you know, I have a connection to the other world, whatever. I have a camera that can see ghosts. And you sit here and I'm going to take your picture. And then you're going to see some sort of figure and it's going to be one of your loved ones. Potentially like, oh, this is a sign that they're a ghost and they're nearby. And I think it came out later that there was techniques that they would use to like double develop photos like over another photo and stuff like that. Like there's 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 things that they were doing to manipulate it to create some of these images. But and, and then it fell out of favor once everybody kind of caught on to that's what they were doing. But there was a period in time where it was like super popular. Everyone thought like, holy shit, we can see ghosts in pictures. So I'm going to go to the spirit photographer and I'll see, you know, my grandma or whatever in the picture with me. I like that they leaned into that. That's kind of continued into the popular consciousness of like uh, of everyone. You know, even if even if you haven't directly interacted with like this sort of history, like you've you've heard like, oh, there's something in this picture or you've seen a movie that has something to do with it or something. And, like that. and that idea is at the core of this show when it's at its best. And this this is this is like a, a cool moment that's like a, a little detail that actually mirrors the greater themes because one of the things that both podcast and show talk about are in the next episode, someone lays this out pretty, pretty explicitly. When you record something, <laughs> the character says, I forget who it is. Maybe you, maybe you remember you're, you're capturing a moment in time and you're giving it immortality that it was never meant to have. And like, who knows what else might be captured while you're doing it. And I was just thinking about our podcast like right now, we are in a moment in time. We are capturing it on audio and then now will be played for people. And there's a weird effect I've gotten with this, right? Where people listen to an episode we recorded like two years ago and comment to me and talk to me as if I just recorded it. For them, they just heard it. So it's fresh. But for me, that happened two years ago and I've forgotten most of it, right? Um, so there's like this weird time effect that can happen. And, and once again, you're, you're like, you're capturing a moment and you're reproducing it and people experiencing it differently. What if in this recording, there's a fucking demon, right? right. Underneath or some mold. in the, in the, there's, there's a mold in this room, right? And it's in the, it's in the audio it somehow gets embedded and just listening to it gives it power, releases it back into the world in some way. And that's what this show is all about. And I love that. That's a cool idea. Do you want to uh, tell the audience about your close encounter recently with uh, with some technological? Uh... Oh, shit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was creating an image for our last episode because I create these images for like our YouTube. If you look at our YouTube uh, video, if you're on YouTube right now, uh, it's for the last episode. Um, I was creating this image and I create it in Photoshop. And then at the end of my uh, thing, I set the parameters and I export it into a JPEG. And then that's the image I upload, right? So I exported it, everything I know. I've done this hundreds of times. 
And uh, yeah, I, I pulled it up and the image had been like half of the image, like three, two thirds of it had this like weird blue green square kind of over part of the image, this distortion. And I, I literally saw it when I was uploading it, getting ready to post it. And all of a sudden I went, wait, what? Well, something's wrong with the image. And I went and looked. It was just all distorted. I don't know why. So I went back to, to, to Photoshop, did the exact same process, changed nothing, exported it again. Second time came out just fine. So I don't know what happened there other than uh, Caligo got in the fucking image and fiddled with the bits, I guess. I mean, like, anything is possible. I sent you a picture of it. I was, I was like, kind of yeah. freaking out. I was like, what the fuck is happening here? Coincidence, at the very least. <laughs> Coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so episode eight is called What Lies Beneath. Steve reunites Melody with Annabelle in the psychiatric facility, but he won't let Melody leave for her own safety. She escapes to save Jess. Annabelle gives Dan a box of tapes that Jess left for him. The tapes show Melody returning to save Jess. Melody convinces Jess to escape, but Melody is knocked unconscious by John Smith. Samuel and the cult members proceed with the ritual and use Tamara in place of Jessica. Iris appears in the portal, which Sam and Melody enter. Jess, turns, Jess returns with her camera, but runs out of the building as the ritual ends in flames. Davenport declines to help Dan find Melody. Mark and Dan decide to try the ritual themselves, but Bobby stops them at gunpoint, revealing herself to be a baldung and Melody's birth mother. Bobby sends Dan to the other world where he sees his late family before finding Melody. They make their way to the portal exit pursued by Calego. Samuel appears at the exit, pulling Melody through. Melody and her mother are reunited and Mark frantically calls for Dan. Dan awakens in a hospital bed to discover the year is 1994, weeks after the Visser fire. Yeah, on the day that Kurt Cobain's death was announced on MTV News. Yeah, that sucks, dude. That's a brutal day to, yeah. to come back. I remember watching that fucking Kurt Loder newscast on there. Like, that when that showed that, I remember watching that when I was, That's like, crazy, nine man. years old. Right. That's insane. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't listen to Nirvana. I think I had heard, probably heard them before, but, like, I didn't really know who they were. But, like, I just, I still remember seeing that. Man, okay, so this episode is like it's it's a mixed bag, right? But um, there's some cool stuff. Um, I do love the like you were talking about before. We get the reveal that Jesse has this old camera that was a, it used to record film on a cassette tape, which I don't even know if right. that, it, like I assume that must be possible, right? Like that's not something they would yeah. just make up for the show. I think it's possible. It must yeah. be. I thought that was really cool. I love that Dan's like knowledge of these things is like the only reason that he's able to to figure out how to watch it. Um. You know, that was cool. Again, the footage didn't quite sell me. It felt like it was modern footage being distorted quite a bit. It's it's just, it's just a shame they couldn't somehow do something with real film. Yeah. And to be honest with you, like, you know, I don't know for a fact that they didn't, but I, it looks like they did not. It looks like they did not. Um, I would be shocked if I was wrong about that. One thing that I thought of during all of this, just as a kind of a quick aside, I think this would have made a great video game. I, I do think it made a good show. But, like, mm -hmm. um, have you played the game Outlast? Yeah. Yeah. Remember how, like, he uses a, you use a camera in that game? Right. And there's a cool element of, like, in order to see, you have to have your night vision on. And, like, that's, like, your basically your flashlight. I like the idea of, uh, you know, a, a game like this where you're having to, like, record. There's something about having to record, but then also watching back the tapes at some point would be cool. Like, I feel like there's a lot of fun stuff you could have done. Keep it that soft horror, though, because my main prob problem with Outlast is that it was much more that, like, jump scare, har like, hard horror, I guess you would call it, um, which isn't as much my bag. Um, but, like, a soft horror version of that would be really cool. I like the idea of, like you said, they would have to make it make a reason for you to watch back the footage, but I love the an idea of, like, you watching back the footage and not realizing how close to death you were, like, in that in that run or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know? or, yeah, something something is distorted, and then you have to, like, learn things up or make, make right. assumptions based off of changes. Anyway, I, I just, like, I love this as a show, but I feel like an Archive 81 uh, video game would be pretty cool. Here's our knocked unconscious trope. Uh, we get that. I think it's just a punch from J old John Smith. Um, oh, another another pet peeve of mine. Um, I feel like I don't see this one as much. And usually it occurs when you know the show is not adult enough, quote unquote, to show it. But the um, the insta kill throat slit has always kind of bothered me. It's such a violent, bloody way to die. 
I guess someone might pass out when it happens, and maybe that's what you can. But like we've seen it twice now in the snuff film, and when she, when they repeat it here again, where he slits the throat and the person drops like a sack of potatoes and is out and is dead, instant death. And it's just like that's not really. I don't know. I mean, like clearly, I don't know from like firsthand experience or anything, but just like. From from my understanding of anatomy, like stuff I've read, stuff I've seen, it's just I think like, if the eh. jugular gets cut, though, they they are dead within seconds. Seconds, but there, but there's difference between seconds and instant. And it felt like here it was instant death. And they'd, you'd be grabbing at your throat and exactly. Like panicking there was and none stuff, of yeah. that. It was sack of potatoes, dead on the ground. And that's just not. It just didn't. And again, we're this is a you know adult show has plenty of curse words. I think you can lean into the violence of this moment. Like maybe they didn't want to go there, but yeah, it feels like they played it pretty PG 13 for the most part. That felt like it was, it clashed with the other, other feel of the show. Like I wanted it to be a little darker there. Maybe that's fucked up of me to say. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I actually did remember um, feeling like pretty early on. I had a good idea that Bobby, the groundskeeper was Melody. Oh yeah. And I was wrong apparently because I thought that she was there. I thought she was there at the, at the um, seance, but that never came up again. So I guess I just miss on, I just, it looked like her, but I guess it wasn't her. I think I actually cut that part of our last episode too. So when that was revealed to me, I was like, fuck, I shouldn't have cut that part. (laughs) Yeah. That's okay. Well, (laughs) I was wrong. So (laughs) if it's still in there, you know, I'm I'm mea culpa. I I, I got no, but either way, I I just, um, you know, I felt like that was another, another instance where like it was, it was obviously somebody we knew and it felt like somebody we'd at least heard of. And uh, she's like lingering over the tapes and stuff a lot, like staring at them. And it just felt like she knew. There was some cool tying things back moments, right? Like that that explained the lingering looks, you know, that totally works. Oh, and then so I did want to also talk about the this whole portal and everything that's created in the way I feel like it starts to lose me uh, because it becomes really convoluted at the here. And, and I know that part of it should be he comes through and he has like five minutes and he has to, he has to follow the sound back. Um, there's a lot of rules being set by this ball dung that I'm like, how do you know any of this? Yeah. Like, yes. So he, and, and then like he meets with his family for a little while. Like, what was that? Like, do, what does that have to do? Like, is that the power of the God? Yeah, is it's the that... God trying to, she says he'll try and trick you. And that was my, my reading. But it leads me to, he eventually finds Melody and then they're escaping together. They're running away from the, this creature. And then eventually out of nowhere, Samuel jumps in and we hadn't seen him, grabs her, jumps through the portal. And for whatever reason, he couldn't also make it back through the portal. I think he did. I just think he didn't come out in the room for some reason. Um, I think if we had gotten a season two, we would have found out that Samuel escaped in that moment somehow um, back into the world. Um, that's my guess because it is a weird, it's a weird dangling thread right now. Like why did Samuel grab her, pull her through and then she's out and he's not, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Otherwise it, it was. Yeah, I agree. It'll probably be explained eventually or it would no, have been, no, it but, won't be. I think it would have been. <laughs> yeah. But this idea, but then also Dan, like Dan doesn't make it through even though he's touching her hand basically. Yeah. And he could like, now this might be some stuff from season two um, because I was thinking about it and like, I shouldn't be surprised that Dan is, missing at the end of this episode because dan is missing in the podcast that's something that we lead off with is mark saying my friend dan is gone um and i think season two it wouldn't surprise me if it was like yeah dan actually went back in time or something like you know what i mean like something somehow we find like tapes of dan back in the past and he's like how is this even possible and like you know i I wouldn't be surprised if we're gonna get some stuff like that and that was where they were going with this that's my guess what did you think about the the captain america Waking up in the hospital room and then not knowing what year it is and then being yeah, like, oh, I yeah. mean it's, it's been done a lot of times. The, the MTV right. thing was like okay, it's interesting he's on that day, but like sure, I mean, I guess it, it works. Um, the, the shot where they were like going to show the city, but then they just instead show the reflection where you see the two towers. Uh, okay, that I guess that's kind of neat. Um, yeah, and then I was like, okay, so like he's got to stop nine eleven now, right? Like, there's no way. Fucking invest in Apple. First off, right. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff you could do. I mean, I guess he is in a, in a facility where he's locked up, so he probably can't like start doing great stuff. But <laughs> bet on bet on the Patriots for, for a long period of time <laughs> in the 2000s. My problem is I wouldn't be able to remember like what fucking year did. The... And then I'd bet the wrong year. Be like, oh, damn it. That was the one year they didn't win. <laughs> 
yeah. Uh, I, I, so one thing, yeah. I, I mean, Samuel was this weird dangling thread because in the podcast, he kind of joins with the demon. And I thought for sure we're going to see Samuel and the demon combining in some way. And if not him, then at least um, this Iris character. But in neither of them that happens. We see the demon again in like a mirror. So I thought it was weird that the demon couldn't interact with him directly, even though theoretically they're in his space. They're in this demon's space. It, it was weird that he was still trapped behind something. And that wasn't explained. So as much as they were trying to explain things, and this often happens... Through the explanations of the supernatural, you start to open yourself up to a lot of people being able to poke holes in it and go like, okay, if that's the case, then why not this and why not that? And if it's in like, as soon as you've provided an answer, now all of a sudden you've you've opened yourself up to these kind of questions that you might not have good answers right. for. Just don't make the rules. Just have, have it be weird and like, like you know, a, a, there's, a, there's a balance, obviously, like we've talked about. This honestly felt a little bit rushed. This probably should have been expanded out a little more. This could have been two, across two episodes, do a little bit less of the flashback. This mirror dimension was under underserved. And the other thing that I, that I thought was a strange choice was you establish so much how time is different on the other side. Time moves at a different pace. It stops. It does weird things. Yet you set a five minute timer. Like you've just done all this explaining about how much how much time doesn't apply to you over there. And then I'm going to say, no, you have five minutes because I think Dan should have said like, OK, well, what does that mean? Is that how long is that over there? We don't well, know. Then doesn't his like clock and then like the clocks and his watch like, they stop. stop moving. And does stuff? he still have five yeah. minutes? I don't know. Right. I don't Again, know. You're, you're setting weird parameters to try and set a ticking clock, which adds a sense of urgency. But I think you shot yourself in the foot because you're introducing weird rules that don't seem to make sense. Um, and again, I, I would have liked to see this this space explored a little bit more um, in some way. I guess I'm not sure exactly what, what what I would have liked to have happened, but you know, it just feels like there was there was a potential for more here. And it, I have to I, I feel sorry for him because honestly, it, it a lot of this stuff they're probably wanting to stay for season two. And if they had known they were not going to get a season two, they would have written these last two episodes completely differently. I guarantee you that. hundred percent. Well, and it's one of those things too, where it's like, if you are pretty confident, which I'm sure they were really confident they were going to get a season two based on, you know, the success of how well it did. And it seems, sounds like they should have got a season two. If you're going to get a season two, you expect higher budget, more leeway to do what you want and like that those sort of things tend to happen and so yeah. well because you know if you're getting a season two you were popular so maybe there's you got a longer rope right exactly and and you know to see, a lot of shows don't hit their stride in the first absolutely season, you know? and that that's the other shame so many shows how often does someone say hey you should watch this show the first season's just okay but you got to keep going like you hear that all the time because shows sometimes take a little while and it's it's so unfortunate that a show with so much promise is cut short like this. Um, it, it, again, like so so just a, an A B it right. Like the on one hand, I agree the swirly stuff. Um, it it didn't work very well for me. It wasn't very scary. It felt very CGI. It was okay. It was well crafted. Um, the only thing I liked about it is that when we saw it through the lens of a camera in world. It looked like a weird blooming flame. Right. And we never actually saw any flames, but I always got the implication that this swirl caused the fires that we were being told happened at these different areas. These big fires burned the building down. Um, so I liked that part of it. But when you're actually seeing it, it reminded me of some of my least favorite parts of Lovecraft Country. Um, I'm thinking of like, I mean, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's an early episode in that where... There was a very CGI heavy sequence and it just, eh, I didn't really love it, you know? Um, and, and similarly here, like this moment was not, was, was not quiet. This was not creeping, you know, in, I, I get that sometimes you have to deliver. You can't always just hint, but there's, I, it, I don't know. There are ways to do it and this didn't feel like maybe the right choice, but so on one hand, you have that, but on the other hand, like how inventive this show was, the found footage element of it, they were doing stuff, they were playing with this stuff in a way that I hadn't seen before, um, especially at this level of execution, of, of the inherent creepiness of watching someone else video and like seeing creepy shit and not knowing 
what's being caused by distortion that's normal and what's being caused by distortion that's supernatural. All that stuff works really, really well. And um, it's such a shame that we're not yep. going to see what they could have done with it. Yeah. I mean, I think this naturally leads us into our next thing, too, because I feel like you're really t- saying a lot of your thoughts on the show. So do you want to do you want to weigh in about uh, podcast versus show in this case? Yeah. Podcast versus show. Um, wow. Well, yeah. It's tough because uh, much like when we read novels, I always want to give a lot of credit to the origin and I'm going to give it here. It, the show owes a lot to the origin in, in this podcast. It's so cool how it was just two guys and their friends, it seems like, um, over the course of a weekend recording this thing. Um, and then it, 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 the the d- delivery behind it was so clever. Such a smart marketing. They understood the power of um, anticipation, which I think is something this show lacked. I touched on it last episode uh, for our podcast. I really thought this show should have been released week to week and built popularity and discussion over time and they totally missed an opportunity by not doing that so all those things i think the the podcast did right however i'm such a sucker for the actual found footage quiet creepy moments that we got in the show and the way it came together and the 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 way they they let off every episode with some other element of footage there were so many things that when they were working, were working so, so well in the show that it actually stuck with me more than I think anything in the podcast will long term. So I'm going to give it to the show. You know, even with the criticisms I've leveled at it this episode, I, I'm still giving it to the show. I love so much of the show, the first half especially. And like you said, there are a lot of clever things going on. The references were some of my favorites. And it's not like dumb references right it's not something that that like you're just gonna walk in and know everything and it's like these like very broad things like it's it's niche and it's nerdy and it's cool because they're referencing film history and they're referencing the history of like the different mediums and and that's sort of what the podcast is too right it's like a really nerdy look at what like sort of a viral small scale project it reminds me of almost like people trying to replicate what they did with the Blair Witch late 90s uh this idea that this videotape was real. It was this real videotape that people found and then they're releasing it as a film and it's this like brilliant marketing, which side note, I have a producer that I work with who who worked on Blair Witch. Like that was how he got his start. And like hearing the stories from him about like the small scale nature of it. And it reminds me of like what you're, you're dealing with with the podcast here, right? Like it's a bunch of friends and you're, you're making something magical together. And, and that there's something I love about that. Um, the show I think has a lot of good. I think that it's like most of the time, really really good and then other times still serviceable but um just for the sake of the experience i've seen things that are kind of similar to the show before i think it's doing things at a really high level things that i love um but just for the sake that i feel like i haven't had this experience with a podcast before i'm gonna give it to the podcast and like i I really love it in turn in like a unique one-off perspective that that i uh, that that i hadn't had before and as much as i think the show has a lot going for it it kind of it kind of lost me in the second half unfortunately and like i still wish there was a season two like don't get me wrong i like the show and i wish there was a season two but uh for this i'm just going to take the podcast that's how i'm feeling today. okay that, i mean i i can't ever argue with giving it to the to the source i think that you know that that totally makes sense um i do want to say we we're talking about like the tone of the podcast I think they actually struck a really good balance between the 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 sort of like premise that this is found audio and my friend Dan is missing and the tongue in cheek like this is found audio wink. Now, I'm sure there are people who listened to it and thought it was real. You know what I mean? Like because there are lots of people out there and somebody's always going to feel a certain way, but like I think most listeners got the wink. So, I actually think it's pretty cool that they were doing whereas like Blair Witch was a lot of people believed that was real. Yeah, but at the same time, like we were we were cynical back then, I guess. <laughs> I feel like an adult who knew what was happening, like me right now, if Blair Witch came out, even you know, yeah, even in that But we're cynical now because we've we've seen it done. Just with my knowledge of the film industry, there's no way that something like that happens. It's just not possible. Yeah, I, but it was a discussion. I remember having that discussion with my friends. We were like is, this can't be real, right? This can't be real, right? But like, there was no like, you couldn't just Google it and like the answer. You know what I mean? Like, it, there was just something different about that time yeah. period. Well, and the and the websites and stuff too. Where what what like like you if know, you Googled it, what you found was the website which was in on the fiction. Exactly. Yeah. 
I don't know. They had pictures of like they had pictures. They had dug a hole and they had all the the film reels and they're like, this is where we found it. Like, I'm telling you, it was pretty convincing. Like, even though like it's all you have to do is introduce a little bit of doubt. Even though like I was pretty certain it wasn't real, there's just enough doubt that makes you go into that movie and it adds that level of fear. And like you said, today we're too we're cynical, cynical to buy yeah. into that. Yeah, so. we're that and it's like we've seen so many things on the internet. We see aliens constantly <laughs> yeah, on the yeah. internet. So it's just like, what do you, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's all real. Um, okay, so uh, real quick, I just got to say one thing because I have it in my notes and if we leave it, I'll never say it again. Um, I did notice there was a moment where uh, Melody reaches through a broken door to unlock the unlock it and open it. And I, and I remember thinking like, this is an interesting shot. I see it all the time in shows like this. And do you think there's anything to the idea that that is the filmmaker trying to visually represent a piercing of a veil and a reaching into the other side? Because we get that in so many supernatural shows. I feel like there's like a hole through a door. And I'm thinking about like the shining, like Jack Torrance coming through the door. Like there's some element of like passing through a barrier from one world to another. For sure. We love frames within frames. So like if you can if you can film a frame within a frame, it's like endlessly visually interesting. Okay. And uh, people love to do that kind of stuff. So Jack Torrance sticking his face through that frame is like, yeah. you know, extreme. So maybe a bit of both. <laughs> a bit of both, yeah. Cool. I mean, it serves, and everything you do has to serve the story when you're when you're filmmaking. Right. You can't just do it because it looks cool. It needs to have some other reason. Exactly. That makes sense. Uh, okay. So stick around to the very end of the episode because we are going to announce our next two projects, kind of. Um, you'll see what I mean. Um, so yeah, stick around for that. Um, but if you enjoyed this episode, please let us know uh, in a form of a rating and review on whatever app you chose to listen on or on YouTube, like the video, leave us a comment, um, that kind of stuff. Help us get engagement up, get people to listen to our podcast so one day we can have an adaptation too. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure to follow us on social media. I know that today is an interesting day because uh, people might be leaving Twitter, but uh, make sure to follow us. <laughs> yeah, make sure to follow us on uh, Ink to Film at Ink to Film on all platforms, including Twitter for now, um, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, try to find us on other platforms and let us know if there's another platform that everybody's moving to. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, if you could support us on Patreon, uh, that would be awesome. We uh, we actually have merch on there that we've sold some of, but I would love to move a little more to to sort of earn back the the cost that went into it um, and and maybe even get us a little bit of money towards that. We were talking earlier about wanting to get some new microphones and stuff. And in order to get that, we got to get a little more money coming in. So um, if you want to support the podcast, think about getting a T-shirt or a mug or a hoodie with an exclusive design that we have on Patreon that was de designed by Natalie Metzger. It's really cool. Um, check that out. And, uh, you know, that would really help support our show. And thank you to Carl Casey for the use of our intro and outro music. All right. Let's announce our next episode um, and then the one following that. You want to you wanna announce the next one, James? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, the next one is something that's near and dear to my heart, something that people called me in, in school <laughs> at times. Did you hear even. a lot of jokes about it, I bet? Oh, absolutely. So it's uh, James and the Giant Peach. I've never read the story. I think Luke said he has. I think I have. If I did, I was young. Right. And uh, I don't remember it very well. I, you know, I barely remember the movie. I think I've seen it. But I know that it was important to me. I remember liking it. And it's Roald Dahl, which is a, a big name in, in children's literature. Maybe one of the biggest names. Um, and we haven't we haven't covered him yet. Um, obviously, you know, Willy Wonka and the Charlie Factory would be a really obvious choice. I'm sure we will get to that one day. But I thought it'd be fun to start with James and the Giant Peach. Probably not one that people are expecting. Yeah, definitely. And honestly, it... Uh the movie is Henry Selleck, and it, I've talked endlessly about my love for stop motion animation on this podcast whenever I can. And uh, I just like uh, it, it scarred me. Like I'm excited to talk about why. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking. Apparently, about Apparently, the so. book is is even darker than the movie. So look forward to yeah. hearing us react to that next week. Um, we will be covering both, by the way, in the same week. Um, and then following that, we will be doing our first, I think, official Stephen King project of the year for 2022. We always like to do Stephen King. Um, and we are asking for your help in picking uh, which one it will be. So if you are a patron, go over to Patreon. You'll be able to vote on a poll for our next Stephen King project. This is separate from our quarterly project, which is still coming up. But the, the choices are going to be between Misery, Stand By Me, and The Shawshank Redemption. So three iconic novels, uh, three iconic adaptations, Um all great options we were talking about beforehand and we were just like we can't fucking choose like we want to do all of them 
So we're going to put it on, you know, put it in your hands. Which of those three would you mo- most like to hear us talk about? And that'll be the one we do following James and the Giant Peach. Um, and we'll go ahead and put that poll up. Uh, you know, by the time you're hearing this, it should be up on Patreon. Go check it out. Vote. Let us know which of those three you want to hear. And we'll do it. Yeah, I can't wait. Uh, and also kind of, you know, different type stories for King, right? Like not straight yeah. horror. So it'll be interesting to dig into some of those. Absolutely. All right. And until next time. Keep adapting.